the blood of the Lamb. Now I found the greatest love of all is mine since you laid down your life, the greatest sacrifice. so that I can forgive Here I stand Knowing that I'm your desire Sanctified by glory and fire i
Today I'm reading from the NLT Bible and I'm reading 1 Kings chapter 8 verses 1 to 11. The Ark brought to the temple. Solomon then summoned to Jerusalem the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of all the ancestral families of the Israelites. They were to bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to the temple from its location in the city of David also known as Zion. So all the men of Israel assembled before King Solomon at the annual festival of shelters, which is held in early autumn in the month of Athanim. When all the elders of Israel arrived, the priests picked up the ark, the priests and the Levites brought the ark of the Lord along with their special tents and all the sacred items that had been in it. There before the ark, King Solomon and the entire community of Israel sacrificed so many sheep, goats and cattle that no one could keep count. Then the priests carried the ark of the Lord's covenant, the most holy place, and placed it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the ark, forming a canopy over the ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that the ends could be seen from the temple's main room, the holy place, but not from the outside. 
They were still there to this day. Nothing was in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Mount Sinai, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they left the, the land of Egypt. When the priests came out of the holy place, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. Hello, my name's Simon. I'm one of the elders here at uh, Bethel Church, Albury. I want to thank you for hitting the play button on this video, wherever you may find yourself listening. We're in the middle of a series called Thin Places, and it's a look at those moments in the Bible where the gap between the heavenly and earthly dimensions seem to narrow, where heaven spills out onto earth. Remember Jesus teaching us in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come on the earth as it is in heaven. You've heard of the phrase Jacob's Ladder. Now that is a thin place experience that Jacob, Jacob had in a vivid dream in a place called Luz, recorded in Genesis 28. And in that dream he dreamt that there was a stairway that extended from the earth right up to heaven. And at the top of that stairway or ladder was the Lord. And he saw angels ascending and descending upon that ladder. It was such a vivid dream that when he woke up, he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was unaware of it. This must be the very gateway to heaven. And as a result, he renamed that place Bethel, which means house of God, a truly a thin place experience. Last week we looked at the tabernacle. As Israel travelled travel from place to place en route to the promised land, God's presence travels and camps with them in a temporary tent-like arrangement called the tabernacle, which was an earthly shadow of a heavenly design. Set up so that God could be close to his own people and they in turn to him. This week we're going to look at a more temporary, more a more permanent arrangement called the temple. Now it's 971 BC, Israel had finally settled in the land that God had promised to give their ancestors. They could finally plant and harvest what they planted in the same year. Under the rule of King David, God had given them peace from war all around. The law of God was at the centre of of their nation. The economy was strong, justice and law and order were firmly established. There was no more travelling from place to place. Finally they had a land that they could call their own. Yet King David was in his palace one day and as he sat in his palace he considered his surroundings. He said here I am in a palace of exotic woods, of cedar, of gold, of silver, and all these precious stones, and yet the Ark of God, which represented the presence of God, is out there in a tent. And it was at that moment he decided in his heart that he, he wanted to build a glorious house, the best that he could possibly give that was worthy of the name of God. Um, so the idea of a temple was actually conceived in the heart of a man, and that man was King David. But God sent the prophet to David and said, it is good that this idea is in your heart, but you're not gonna be the one who's gonna build the temple because of the blood that you've shed and the wars that you've had to fight. See, David had to subdue the enemies around him. God said to him, I'm going to raise up your son in your place. You're going to have a son and I'm going to give him rest all around. And in that time of peace, he's going to be the one that is going to build a temple for my name. Now, Joseph could have spit his dummy out, but instead he chose to make preparations, to make designs and plans, to gather the materials together, the wood, the iron in great abundance, the silver, the gold, the precious stones, all the fabric, 
He used all his connections in order to organize skilled help. So he had everything ready in place for when Solomon had to begin building the temple. And in a text that was read to us in 1 Kings 8, Solomon is finally on the throne. The temple has just been completed after seven years in the making and we're at the dedication ceremony and all the heads and leaders of the tribe of Israel are present. In the following verses in this chapter, we see the purpose for the building of the temple. Set at the heart of the nation's capital, Mount Zion in Jerusalem, it was meant to be a permanent thin place where God can be close to his people and they to him. A place where they could celebrate and remember and be thankful on all their journeys as a nation from slavery in the land of Egypt through all the trials in the wilderness, part in the Red Sea, all the great deliverance that God brought them through. Finally, to settling them in a land of their own where they could plant and they could eat and they didn't have to move around anymore. And they could be thankful for all those things, a place where they could celebrate. It is also a place where they could call out to God in times of trouble. I remind you of the uh, chapter, the great battle in uh, 2 Chronicles 20, where Jehoshaphat, who was a uh, king of Judah at the time, has uh, the nation of Moab and Ammon joining forces to battle against them. And at that time, they were a very small nation, they were very weak, and they did not know what to do. So they went to the temple and they gathered everyone there all the heads, all the leaders, men, women, children, and they called out to the Lord and they prayed and God brought about an amazing victory. It is also a place, a temple, where people could go to examine their hearts just to see if there was any sin in there, just in case they needed to repent and get rid of anything that was against God's way. The temple was a unique place, a place where God would meet with his people and they with him but the building itself was a thing of beauty it was elaborate and costly in materials in time and in labor but after all that was what was in David's heart to build a magnificent resting place in another place Solomon gives thanks to God saying it's only out of what you have first given us that we give back to you he also acknowledges Solomon the fact that God does not actually live in buildings made by hands since the heavens and the earth cannot contain him how much less these heads yet he calls on God to acknowledge the place and the building that he's built in verse 5 of our text we read that before the ark King Solomon and the entire community of Israel sacrificed so many sheep, goats and cattle that they could not keep count. He says, then the priest brought in the ark and placed it in its rightful place, which is the heart of the temple. That's the most holy place. And what happened next was one of those historic thin place moments recorded in the Bible, witnessed by those present and written down for us to read hundreds of years later. It says a thick cloud covering the glory of the presence of God filled the temple to the extent that the priest could not continue serving. But what does that word glory mean? Whenever it's used in the Hebrew, the word glory means heavy or weighty or great worth or importance or high honour. God had actually honoured their sacrifices with his very presence, covered in a thick cloud for their own safety, truly a thin place where earth met heaven. Now when we read the same account in 2 Chronicles 5, we see that preceding this event was a time of jubilant celebration, thankfulness and declaration of who God is. A sacrifice of praise if you like. Here's the thing, before any glory there is always sacrifice. Now I missed the Olympics this year, I'm sad it's not on. But before any 
athlete takes that rostrum to receive a medal, there is always sacrifice behind the scenes before they win any medal. There's always a training, there's a diet, the things that they choose to eat, the things they choose not to eat. There's the early rising in the morning for training, there's the ice baths, there's the setbacks. There's always sacrifice before any glory. I mentioned Jehoshaphat and the great victory that he saw for his nation Israel. But before that great victory, there was sacrifice. There were the people, the whole nation meeting together in prayer and in fasting, confessing to God. They didn't know what to do. And even before the actual victory itself, it says that they put musicians and singers out in front of the military army singing for he is good and his love endures forever and they lifted up a shout of praise and raised a hallelujah if you like and when they got to the brow of the hill god had set ambushes among the enemy and they killed themselves so the nation of judah didn't even have to lift the sword god had brought about a miraculous battle because of their sacrifice of praise and a sacrifice of prayer. Think of Paul and Silas when, before they even saw the prison doors fly open in Acts 16 and the chains drop off every inmate, there was a sacrifice of praise when they were caught and bruised and hurting after being whipped in prison at midnight, it says, they were singing hymns and praising God and the inmates were listening. Before any glory, before any great victory, there's always a time of sacrifice. Max Licardo says this, To see the glory of God is to pray. Thicken the air with your presence. Make it misty with your majesty. Part heaven's drapes and let your glory spill forth. God, show us God. So what about us? What does this mean for us today? Are there any dedicated buildings or focal points in our communities where we can sense thin places, touching heaven to change earth, God reaching out to us or us to him? Well, I believe so. For every dedicated building or place, whatever that may be, where the church meet together is a potential thin place. Jesus said this, For where two or three are gathered as my followers, I am there among them. And in another place in Revelation 2 verse 1, it says that Jesus is the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, the lampstands being representative of the churches of God. Sometimes when people are looking for God, they find themselves drawn towards the local church building in a hope that they can make some kind of sense of life. I believe above everything else that they're looking for a thin place encounter with Jesus himself to know that he's for real and that he is for them. After the temple was dedicated and the sacrifices made, and after all the music and all the worship and the celebration, came his presence. And that is what changed everything. In everything that is done in church, all the programs that we do, the presentation, the strategy, the social interaction and all the charity work and all the speaking and teaching and even all the worship. Above all that, what makes a thin place in the church? And I believe the answer to that is the presence of God. A place where Jesus can introduce himself to the seeker and the searcher. As for me, this, this local church became my thin place 35 years ago when I first discovered that God was for real and that he really did create 
everything. I've lived in a B69 postcode for all my life. I was conceived at one address in the B69 area. And then I lived at four addresses uh, up until now. I was actually born at home and not in hospital in the B69 postcode on the uh, A457 where the 87 runs through. I've had five jobs and I've only ever had to travel just to the neighbouring town. So like many of you, you could say that I know this place well. But dotted through the local community are thin places, local churches where Christians gather together. And despite our imperfections, Jesus is right there amongst us. And wherever he is, is a thin place. So about the town of Albury. What is it? It's an industrialised market town that spans across two postcodes, B68 and B69. And its current estimated population, and this is uh, estimated because the census is only every 10 years, isn't it? The next one's not due until 2021. So this is an estimated population. of 25,000 and that's in the built-up areas. And it's roughly, almost exactly, a 50-50 male female split with a 40% ethnic mix and even the ages when we take the ages are, are done in, in in decades it's 0 to 9 and then 10 to 19 and then the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s even in those decades the the number of um, citizens is around about 3500 in each category with the exception of the 60 pluses, uh, around about 4,000. And I believe that the church serves as a thin place in Albury to the whole community, to every business, job, family, person, so that it can encounter the good that God has for them, because I believe that every life to God matters. And yet the building is only a meeting place. At the moment, some of us are still meeting online. So this may be your thin place. The Bible says that you all together, this is in 1 Corinthians 3.16, you all together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you. And in another place it says that you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. So whether gathered together in a local dedicated building or gathered together online in a Zoom meeting or scattered about in the mundane of everyday life, God is looking to break through to our world through those thin places we call the local church. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, your word says that we are the temple of your Holy Spirit. And again, we are living stones that you are building into a spiritual temple. Wherever your churches are placed as lampstands in Samuel, I pray that we will wear away thin places between heaven and earth so that you can release on us all the good you intend. Wherever your churches are scattered throughout the community in everyday life, I pray that we will wear away thin places between heaven and earth, so that you can release on us all the good you intend. However your church meets together, whether building or online, whether openly or secretly, I pray that we will wear away thin places between heaven and earth so that you can release all the good you intend. Lord Jesus, I pray that through the thin place of your church, you will introduce yourself to those who are searching for you. I also pray that you will be found by those 
not searching for you. Lord, please visit Albury and Samuel with your glory, I pray. In Jesus' name, Amen.